Hi, I'm indie fantasy author Melinda Cusera, and we're back with fantasy lore and more. And today we're talking to Todd Fonstock. And we're also going to talk about his book, Kaivin the Unkillable, Legacy of Shadows, which is the first book in the World of Avalon fantasy series. And that's a multi-author collaboration. So we definitely want to talk about that. So welcome, Todd. Tell us about Kaivin the Unkillable. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I will make one correction. It's it's the world of Eldros. Uh, Avalon, I don't, I'm not sure uh, uh, about that one, but uh, but Eldros Legacy is the, the name of the, the world in which Kaivin the Unkillable sits. So Kaivin the Unkillable is the first uh, installment of this multi-author, mega epic fantasy shared world experience that we're creating for the readers. Um, there are four founding authors and five continents in this world. So we've got each of the, the uh, founding authors has a continent that they essentially, uh, they're in charge of. They're the creator and the, the um, person who, who makes all of the different individual details about the world, the, the characters, the, the monsters, the races, the geography, the whole nine yards, right? So each one of them has a continent, and then there's one continent of mystery called Lathranon. So we've got Pyranon, we've got Draconon, we've got Daemonon, Noxonon, which is my continent, and then Lathranon, the continent of mystery, which is where the giants originally came from. So this, you might be able to see my shirt here, Eldros Legacy, here there be giants. So essentially, um, the, the short blurb for Eldros Legacy is <clears throat> um, 2,000 years ago, everything was ruled by these 15 foot tall, highly intelligent, highly magical giants, okay? All of the other mortal races, the humans, the dwarves, the elves, the luminance, the shadow var, all of them were slaves to this one race of highly powerful giants, right? They're almost godlike, they're demigods, okay? And then there was a revolution, okay? 2000 years ago, this revolution happened. They overthrew their overlords. And during the war, 50% of the giants died in the war and 50% of the giants fled and vanished. Okay. Now, 2000 years later, we humans, if we can remember something from two decades ago, we're doing good, right? Two millennia ago, forget about it. We think the giants were myths. We don't think they ever actually existed. And we have kind of gone traipsing along with our own little lives and our own little kingdoms, having our own little fights in this medieval sort of Dungeons and Dragons style world. But the giants have not forgotten. And in the shadows, they are building an army that when they're ready to unleash it upon us, it will be impossible for us to stop them. Unless... Of course, we have a group of heroes who can do the impossible. So that is sort of the, the run-up to the first book in this series. So Kaivin is, so um, essentially we're, we kind of made this, all of us agreed to make this sort of PG-13 world that is very Dungeons and Dragons style, right? Um, which means we have a group of heroes that are, that could be corresponding to uh, characters that you would know within the Dungeons and Dragons world. So if, in my case, Kaivin is the warrior, right? We have also the rogue. We also have the ranger slash queen. We have uh, this this paladin character who's who's kind of like a tiefling. He's, he's called a shadow bar. Um, and then we have the mage character. And these five characters have to come together and start learning about this thing that is about to happen to them. So here's the thing. Like I said, people think the giants are myths. Nobody knows that this threat is coming. Um, and that's exactly the way the Giants want it because they got their butts kicked 2,000 years ago and they shouldn't have, right? There is a reason why we overthrew them. There's this, this fifth business character that has been moving things behind the scenes against the Giants that want to kill us. And that is the only reason we escaped total obliteration 2,000 years ago. So now it's coming again. And this, this fifth business character who is a Giant himself, who has decided he's going to betray his own kind to try and preserve the fact that um, preserve the, the, the mortals, the humans, dwarves, elves, all those races, preserve their right to exist, essentially. Um, and so he's, he's this massive sort of strategic game player that is using all of these mortals as pawns. And our heroes are a group of these most promising pawns that he's using. So from their perspective, they kind of hate this guy that's actually rooting for their team and they also have to fight these these other giants. So this is this is sort of the run up and the first book is all about the warrior character Kaivin the Unkillable who is a gladiator on a hot streak. He has been in what's called the Night Ring. 
Um, and it is essentially a Colosseum that is shaped uh, it's, it's a Pentagon. Okay. It's a, a Pentagon Coliseum. And he's won 48 bouts in a row. If he wins 50, he gets elevated to knight status, right? He gets free, his freedom and he also gets prestige the whole nine yards. Right. And so when he wins his 49th bout, the King essentially invites him to dinner and yanks the rug out from underneath him and says, we're not going to do a 50th bout. I want you to do something else. There is a band of rebels in the forest somewhere and I can't find them. But I know that one of their recruiters is in the cells of the Night Ring right now, and he wants to recruit you. And I want you to let him. And then I want you to go with him. And then I want you to find out where this hideout is and tell me, and I'm going to smash it once and for all, right? So Kyvan says, okay, I'm your, I'm your man, boss. I'll do it. Because he wants, he wants his freedom. He wants to be able to, you know, walk down the street and have like everybody go, ooh, ah, look at the night, right? So he's, he's a bit of a selfish character in the beginning of the story. And so he goes to this, this, uh, hideout with the recruiter meets the queen in exile who is the leader of this band of rebels and now he's got a problem because she's awesome she is essentially everything in a leader that this guy back in the castle is not right and so now kaivin has this conundrum either he can turn her over like essentially like betray her go back to uh the castle get everything he's ever wanted and smash out this rebellion forever or he can join a lost cause. And I won't say any more about that. Um, <clears throat> that's kind of the, the setup to the first book. But like the first book is all about his life and it's sort of on the micro level, right? It's like him and his relationships with these people and all this stuff. But none of them have any idea that this war is coming towards them like, you know, a falling stone and there's no way to avoid it. And they, they just, they're not aware of it at this point. So anyways, that's this somewhat short encapsulation of Eldros legacy in the beginning. Now to, to extend that just a little bit further, this is just on the continent of Noxanon, my continent on the other continents. Each of the founders is building something similar. They have their own array of giants that want to squash them in their own configuration. And they've got their own party of people that needs to, uh, you know, stop this. And it, at about book four or five, all of this is going to start coming together and our characters will meet. And then there'll be this huge, throw the ring into Mount Doom, you know, battle for Gondor kind of, of, of ending, right? Where it's all going to come together. So that's, that's what we're doing. And in addition to all that, if that wasn't enough, we have guest authors, which we call cohort authors. They're not founders, but they have come in to play in our world in some, some place or another. Now, some of these stories may have very close ties to the meta plot about the giants, and some of them may be completely separate. Like they have nothing to do with the meta plot. They're just on this part of the continent doing their own little thing, and they have their own little story that happens. It's a beginning, middle, and end, and it's done. So these fun little jaunts in different areas of um, the world of Eldros. So that's that's the project. We've got 11 books at this point. You can check it out on Amazon, um, or actually, even better yet, at eldroslegacy.com. We're selling them directly through the website at this point. So you can check it out at eldroslegacy.com. The whole, like there's, there's at this point, three stories in Legacy of Shadows, which is my uh, story on Noxanon. There's a story in each of the other uh, continents, the, the Founders continents, and then there's a whole bunch of cohort stories in every single continent that there is, so. That is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm like, it's checking all the boxes. I <laughs> I love all that stuff. I, I mean, I write epic fantasy. Obviously, I love all that stuff. And and listeners, the links will all be in the description, so you don't have to like pull over the car if you're driving or stop your workouts and try to write these things down. We will have all the links in the show notes, so don't worry about that. Can we hear an excerpt? Because now oh, I'm really absolutely. excited. But can we absolutely. meet Kaivin? <laughs> all right. Well, let me introduce you to Kaivin. All right, I got it right here. Give me just a second. All right. Kaivin the Unkillable, Chapter 1. Kaivin. Two knights threw open the door of the tavern, and the scent of last night's rain blew in with them. Kaivin heard their boots thump on the rough planks, heard the creak of leather and clink of chainmail as they shifted. He sat with his back to them, but he didn't need to see them to know where they were. The room went silent. This dockside drinking hole didn't see knights very often, and their appearance had rendered <clears throat> uh, their in the place, the entire place, speechless. That was respect. That was what being a knight meant in the kingdom of Usara. 
They paused just inside the threshold, perhaps hoping to spook the fearful. But Kaivin wasn't a jumper. He had more in common with the newcomers than those who fled from them. Isla, the pretty barmaid sitting across from him, looked past Kaivin, her eyes wide. She had been a lively conversationalist a moment ago, and he'd been daydreaming about what it would be like to kiss those lips. Now she looked like an alley cat who'd spotted an alley dog. Reflexively, um, sorry, I wanted to kill that thing. Hang on just a second. <clears throat> I lost my, lost my place. Reflexively, she stood up, the wooden stool scraping loudly on the floor. She froze, perhaps realizing belatedly that when the powerful, the predators, were in the room, it was best not to draw attention to yourself. Kaivin heard the metallic rustle of the fighter's chainmail and Isla's face drained of color. He envisioned the alley dogs turning at the sound, focusing on her. She needn't have worried. They weren't here for her or any other patron of the Mariner's Rest. They were here for Kaivin. He had killed a man in the night ring two days ago, and not just any man, a duke's son. The entitled whelp had actually been a talented swordsman, but his ambition had outstripped his skill, and the night ring was an unforgiving place to discover such a weakness. After Kaivin had run the boy through, Duke Barricourt had sworn revenge. No doubt he had been waiting for an opportunity to find Kaivin alone, vulnerable, to send in his butcher knights. Men like these, sent to enforce a lord's will or show his displeasure, were called butcher knights. Usually of the lowest caste, knights of the steel, butcher knights didn't chase glory on the battlefield or renown in the night ring. They were sent to do bloody back alley work at their lord's bidding. Kaivin took a deep breath of the smoky air, sipped from the glass of Triadan whiskey, and enjoyed the fading burn down his throat. The booted feet thumped to a stop next to his table. Kaivin the Unkillable? One of the men spoke, using Kaivin's ringer name, the flamboyant moniker the, the crowd had laid upon him. Kaivin glanced over his shoulder. Indeed, he had guessed right. The pair were Knights of the Steel. There were three castes of knights in Usara, knights of the sun, knights of the dark, and knights of the steel, which was the lowest caste and the only one available to most lords. The pair wore chain mail instead of full plate, conical steel caps and nose guards instead of full helms, and leather greaves and bracers. As predicted, they wore Duke Barricourt's crest on their left shoulders. There was a code of honor among knights, even butcher knights, except in cases of war, civility was required before gutting a man, especially when there were onlookers. Often, a knight would give a flowery speech, including the offense he'd been sent to address, before drawing weapons. This was enough to justify murder. Sometimes, there was no flowery speech, but a knight would always at least say their victim's name. If the victim acknowledged their name, that was all it took to bring out the blades. Kaivin didn't give them the satisfaction. He took another sip of his whiskey and said nothing. Did you hear me? The knight demanded, his hand touching his sword hilt. If Kaivin had been a normal ringer, a caged slave thrown into the night ring to slay or be slain for the sport of the crowd, these men would probably have foregone their code of honor and drawn their swords already. But Kaivin wasn't just any ringer. He was the champion of the night ring, and the king had afforded him special privileges because of that fact, like a room at the palace. Kaivin had survived 48 bouts, the longest string of victories since, well, since Vex the Victorious had claimed 50, won a knighthood, and become the king's personal bodyguard. Steel scraped on steel, bringing Kaivin back to the present. The second knight drew his dagger and placed it against Kaivin's throat. Isla gasped and backed away. You think you're protected, the second knight growled in Kaivin's ear. You're not. Of course, if Kaivin didn't acknowledge his name, there were other ways for the butcher knights to start the fight. If Kaivin attacked them, for example, they could retaliate. The powerful could always push a victim into a corner when they needed to. That's what the powerful did. Kaivin had learned that long ago. That was why, when Kaivin had won his 40th bout and his freedom... From the night ring, he'd continued fighting, risking his life in every bloody bout, for the prize at the end of ten more bouts, for the power that would come with it. When Kaivin won his fiftieth, he would be elevated to knighthood, just like Vex the Victorious, and no one would look at him as a victim again. The blade broke the skin, just barely, and a bead of blood trickled down Kaivin's neck. His pulse quickened. 
The familiar euphoria filled him, the rush of pleasure that came with the threat of death. The euphoria brought vision, and Kyvan saw with new eyes, his battle eyes. He saw his foe's strengths and weaknesses as a swirling blue-colored wind. You are Kyvan the unkillable, the man breathed in his ear. Kyvan chuckled. The second knight's face turned red. He slashed, but Kyvan was already moving. He shoved his palm against the man's fist, arresting the strike. The blade nicked Kyvan's neck, but that wasn't enough. That wasn't nearly enough. Kyvan twisted his assailant's fist and the man grunted in pain. The dagger fell into Kyvan's right hand. The euphoria sang through him and he saw how this fight would go. The blue wind would show him where he must strike, where his enemies would try to strike. Kyvan shoved the dagger's flat steel pommel underneath the knight's nose guard. The heavy steel jammed into that painful spot just below the man's nose, right above his teeth. Bone crunched. The knight stumbled back with a cry, hands flying to his face and knocking his helm askew. His legs wobbled and gave out while Kyvan delicately pinched the pommel of the falling man's sheathed sword between two fingers, lifting it from its scabbard. With an outraged cry, the first knight pulled his blade and lunged. He was fast but the blue wind swirled, showing Kyvan where he needed to be. He danced with it, one step ahead of it, exploiting the man's weaknesses. Kyvan's new opponent was left-handed, which gave him an advantage against those who didn't expect it. Also, he was fast. Those were his strengths, but he leaned on them like a crutch, and that, in itself, was a weakness. The man thrust at Kyvan, a clean, straight strike. Kyvan twisted, let the blade come within an inch of him. It licked past his chest like a snake's tongue as he slid inside the man's guard. This close, swordsmanship didn't matter. Belly to belly with the stunned knight, Kyvan wrapped his arm around his foe's sword arm and wrenched upward. The man gasped, jumping onto his tiptoes to escape the joint lock. His sword clanged to the ground. Kyvan kneed him in the groin. The knight doubled over with a grunt and backed up. The agony of a groin strike always came with a delay, but the realization came immediately. He gave Kyvan a wide-eyed look of disbelief. Then the pain hit him. With a shuddering gag, he slid to his knees. To his credit, he pulled his dagger, but the hilt clacked on the wood floor as he fell on all fours, gasping for breath, twisting, and hoping for some position that would ease the pain. Unfortunately for him, no such position existed. The first knight collapsed onto his side, groaning pitifully. Kyvan picked up the man's sword and added it to his collection. By this time, the second knight had staggered to his feet, helmet lopsided, nose broken, blood pouring down his chin. He blinked one eye and then the other like he was trying to get at least one of them to work correctly. Kyvan tossed the dagger hilt first at Broken Nose, who yelped and dodged. The dagger hit the bar and thunked to the floor. Well done, Kyvan said. Try again. He offered the man's sword next, hilt first. Broken Nose stared at it like it was a rainbow-colored snake. Kyvan raised an eyebrow. Yes? No? Would you like it back? The knight took the sword with a shaking hand. Kyvan dropped the other blade next to Need in the groin, who was still doubled up, hands cradling his jewels. The euphoria faded, the blue wind vanished, and Kyvan let out a breath. He walked back to the stool, sat down, picked up his glass of Triadon whiskey, and winked at Isla. Kyvan was always surrounded by enemies, but that was a good thing. If you remembered that everyone was your enemy, you were never surprised when they attacked. A shuffling step behind him told him that Broken Nose had regained some of his courage and, just maybe, was thinking about jumping back into the fray. Come at me again, Kyvan said darkly, and I'll pretend we're in the night ring. The shuffling step stopped. Go back to Duke Barracourt and tell him that his son chose his path and that he fought well. The Duke shouldn't sully that with back alley theatrics. Kyvan paused for a breathless moment, the whiskey halfway to his lips as he listened for what choice the knight would make. There were several awkward thumps as need in the groin got painfully to his feet, but Broken Nose didn't come any closer. They were afraid of him now. That is power, Kyvan thought. It's the only thing that ensures safety, the only thing that really matters in the end. He downed the rest of his whiskey and stood. A smile had begun on Isla's pretty face. He nodded to her, much as he'd like to explore what that smile might avail him. It was time for bout 49. It was time for Kyvan to do what he did best. Gentlemen, he said to the butcher knights as he stepped around them and walked to the door. That's chapter one.
Wow. That, that was an action packed chapter. <laughs> <laughs> Edge of your seat. Epic fantasy. That's what I write. That's what I write. <laughs> no, I like it. That's, that's kind of my favorite type to read. Oh, cool. Well, if you like fast paced fantasy, that's what I do. That's what I do. And it opens with a bang. I mean, this is chapter one. There's a prologue that comes before this that kind of sets the sort of 10 year stage as to like where the where the plot's going to go. But this is this is the one that kicks things off. This is how we get to know Kaivin just a little bit. I see. So you summarize the prologue for us before reading us this chapter. Well, in fact, no, I summarize oh. the meta plot of like the entire shebang, the prologue. So I'll give I'll give you a little quick summary if you want of the prologue. So yeah, 10 years, 10 years ago. Um, uh, Baron Vamrith staged a coup and killed the king, the queen, their four sons and daughters, and tried to kill their fifth and youngest daughter, who escaped. She's the one that's in the, the woods now, 10 years later, that is organizing this rebellion. Okay, so that's the that's the meta plot startup, is, is he essentially uh, kills everybody in the castle except the uh, the daughter um, and her best friend, who is the Luminant, uh, which are elves. So everything in Noxanon is based on light and dark, okay? Um, there are these places called the Noctum, where um, once upon a time, the entire continent was covered with this spell that's called the Noctum, which everything is pitch black and there are monsters in there. But at one point, this thing called the Lux was thrown into the mix of it and essentially exploded most of it. So there's still a big, huge cluster in the center of the continent and then splatters of Noctums everywhere else that could be anywhere from 10 feet wide to, you know, a thousand miles wide, right? I mean, like it's, it just depends on where you are. And so um, uh, luminance were created by the giants. Almost every race, except for humans who were indigenous was created by giants experimenting with the genetic, genetic possibility of humans and creating these other things. Like, so dwarves, which are called delvers in this world, elves, which are called luminance in this world, shadowvar, which are, are sort of the tieflings of this world, um, as well as a number of other races. There's a minotaur race and um, the demijos, which is another human race. Anyways, all of them were created by the giants to have special properties in the dark. And luminance, when they get emotional, their hair glows. It's this magical light, right? Um, and so they can, like if their hair is, is dark black, it will glow purple, right? If their hair is, you know, bright blonde, it will glow golden, right? So, so like these, Galadriel, <laughs> exactly, exactly like Galadriel, right? Right. So, um, but maybe even, maybe even more so, I mean, maybe even in the Noctum, it's pitch black. I mean, Galadriel's kind of shining in the dim of the forest, but like, this is, this is like, you can't see it so black in there. Um, and you actually can't take natural lights because, like I said, there are monsters in there. And if they the natural light hurts them, you bring in a torch into the Noctum, they are going to see you. They're going to charge you. They're going to attack you. They're going to eat you. If you go in with a magical light, you know, you probably got a chance to make it a certain distance before they find you and eat you. Um, but uh, if you bring in like natural light, they're going to kill you right away. So luminance were created to work in the dark. And so that's her best friend. And they both plunge into the Noctum, which nobody's been in, in years and years and years, hundreds of years. You know, you don't go into the Noctum. It's a sure fire death sentence. And so he forces them into the Noctum and assumes that they're eaten. Well, 10 years later, somehow they survived and they formed a rebellion and they want to overthrow him. So that's the prologue chapter. Do we get the how she survived? Because that sounds like a really interesting story. And do these Noctums move around or are they stuck uh, in one place? They are stuck in one place for now. But um, so, yeah, they do not move around. And yes, the entire story, I'm glad you asked that. Um, I did a short story called The Darkest Door and it is on elderslegacy.com as well. You can find that short story. Um, you can get that short story, which shows Ren's um uh, sort of her origin story, Ren and Laurel. Ren is the, the daughter of the king and Laurel is the... Um, the luminant. Wow. That sounds like a really cool story. I'm <laughs> going to have to check that out after this. Um, you should definitely <laughs> check it out. You'll enjoy it. Like I said, if you like that first chapter, you're going to love the book. It's, it's, there's a lot of that in there. I mean, there's definitely some world building where we kind of slow down a little bit and kind of start, you know, making the, uh, making the full painting, you know, the, the entire mm -hmm. canvas. But uh, Kyvin, Kyvin's, he's a fast thinker and he's a fast actor. <laughs> it's like pretty much in his world, it's like, if it's safe, then great, I'll be happy. And if it's not safe, well, I'm going to try and kill it. It's kind of his, his attitude. Um, so it's working for him. I mean, he's won 49 fights. 49, so yeah, it's clearly yeah. working for him that philosophy. Yes, yes. Until, of course, you know, he comes upon something that 
can't be fixed by killing it. You know, that's that, of course we always the heroes always have to face something that is their Achilles heel. So yeah, that they definitely do, and it's so he's going to come up against something that he can't kill. A problem well, that I don't can't wanna, be solved by anything. death. I'm guessing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to throw in too many spoilers. Um, okay, um, nope, that's fair. He will be put to the test. There's no question. Nope, that's fair. I love the the what you're talking about the light and dark. I do a lot of that in my epic fantasy. But it, yeah. it sounds like we're both heavily influenced by Tolkien, as <laughs> are a lot of epic fantasy authors. So that's no big spoiler there. And yeah, he did use a sure. lot of dark and light imagery. Mm -hmm. you know, I like the idea of like the the Noctum. Is there Very more you can say about that or is absolutely. that too spoilery? No, I, I, mean, I will tell you anything you want to know. I just don't want to spoil any of, any of the story for you. But yeah, I mean like, so in the Noctum, um, well, I'll tell you a little bit about what's, what's, what he's going to find in the Noctum. So in the Noctum are what's called Naragis. Now these Naragis are essentially an old word for castle, for, for structure, right? And a lot of them are ruins, but they are holdovers from the age of the giants. So at a certain point, Kaivin and several of his companions go into this Noctum. Um, there is a thing. In fact, give me just a second and I will show you exactly what it looks like. It's called an Amulet of Noxon and I actually have a real live replica. Right yeah, oh, in my hand. Where, did, where did you get the replica from? Oh, well, that is a really cool story. So this right here is the Amulet of Noxon. Um, so each of the... Um, each of the continents has a symbol. That is the symbol of Noxon. As you can see, it is a sun that is being eaten by inky tentacles. Okay, so these Noctums on the outside, they all have these tentacles that are trying to grab you and pull you into the Noctum. So you really, you cannot walk right up to the wall of the Noctum. You got to stay about 12, 15 feet away if you don't want to get sucked into it, right? So that's the symbol of Noxon. Now there are these amulets that allow you to travel the Noctum. So you put this amulet on and then you hold it up and you circle it clockwise with your finger. And then rather than being in pitch black, you will see everything in shades of gray, right? So you'll have like night vision is what you'll have. And you'll be able to see in the Noctum. Not only that, but for a limited time, like the, the, the amulets have a charge, which can last anywhere from an hour to three hours, depending on how old the amulet is and how much of its charge has been used up. But during that time, none of the monsters will attack you because it'll burn them like they're like they've got some internal fire. Right. But they can sense when the power of the amulet is going low and they'll get closer and closer and closer to you. And, you know, and if you don't jump back out of the Noctum, you know, before the amulet uh, is spent, then they're going to eat you. Right. And then there's a whole wait, wait. scene. How do you charge the amulet? And and for listeners who are not able to see this, there's actually a black band that encircles the uh, the the black tentacles that are eating the sun, which is a represented by a white disc. And that's what Todd was circ was circling clockwise with his finger. Yeah. So pretty cool. Yeah. All right. So uh, how do you charge this? How so and it, and so and also what what degrades the charge? How did yeah? Let's let's perfect. talk about the mechanics of that. I'm Excellent. interested. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> So just leaving the Noctum, just taking the amulet out of the Noctum into what the, the Noctum creatures call the Lightlander world, right, um, is will charge the, like over the course of a day or so, it'll it'll have its charge back and you can head back into the Noctum, right? Um, what causes- Oh, it oh so it charges on its own. You don't have to do anything. You, you just- Nope. You just go back to your world. And, and just for clarification, in the Lightlander world, is it like normal, like hours? Is there day yep. and night? Or is it like yep. always day there and the Noctum yep. is always dark? Nope. It's it's night and day. It's like our world. So Okay. Like, gotcha. You know, in fact, the kingdom that we start in, Usara, is based pretty closely on Colorado. That's where I live. So there's pine trees, there's aspen trees. It's, you know, got a fairly long winter, you know, uh, a, a normal summer. And then like, it's got, it's got the four seasons, you know, whereas like something like something like Demijos, which is another kingdom on the continent, which is way far South, kind of like the opposite North to South is like, you know, 75 to 80 degrees all the time. It doesn't have seasons really the way that we would know seasons. So it's more of a tropical kind of, uh, kind of land down there but yeah so so yeah there's there's night there's day um it's the regular cycle of the sun kind of traveling around the world but the the noctum itself is a spell that was cast uh. thousands of years ago right so that is is the abnormal world but there are creatures plants and animals both that have learned 
to thrive in the dark. And in book two, Lorel of the Dark is what it's called. She goes into the Great Noctum and stays there for most of the book. And you get like all of the different, like, I mean, plants will create their own versions of photosynthesis to keep going. And of course, you know, their leaves are not green, their leaves are black, and there's all kinds of creatures that thrive in the Noctum. I mean, it's a whole ecosystem in and of itself without any light. Um, okay, so what? Yeah. So then, how does okay? So you said that a spell created the noctum. Yes. So what powers the spell? Because no spell can last forever. Oh, I'm it's, so glad you asked that question. Oh, I'm so. going to ask you a million questions. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to you a fantasy author like you. <laughs> <laughs> We're Fair warning. The mechanics of the of the magic of the world. Okay, so um, there are five streams of magic: land magic, lore magic, love magic, life magic, and line magic. Now they have different names, but essentially, land magic is like uh, Avatar: The Last Airbender. It's like it's elemental elemental bending. Okay, fire, air, water, stone, that kind of thing. It's physics. It's like manipulating the physics of the world. Right. Life magic has to do with that sort of slippery thing that creates something that makes them alive, right? Uh, healers, clerics, druids, all of these would be life mages, right? Um, love magic would include not only like affecting people's emotions, like somebody who is like magically charismatic, but also mentalism, mind control, that kind of thing. That, that would be like anything having to do with dealing with uh, a sentience emotions and and intellect right that that's be, cool that they're grouped together because right? usually that's separated very cool yeah Go on. yeah yeah yeah. so um and then uh what did i do i did land life i did love um so lore magic is essentially what gandalf does right i mean like rarely gandalf did something like create the big shield as the balrog is like hitting him with the sword but most of the time what Gandalf did, aside from a little bit of light in Moria here and there, was he's always in the right place at the right time, right? His, his always... power, motivational speech. <laughs> yes, exactly. He's in that crux moment that may be some quiet little moment off to the side of the main mm -hmm. events of the world. But in doing that, he sets a hobbit in motion that will then govern the fate of all, right? Like he's, and lore magic is a limited version of seeing the future. So what lore mages do is they see these things called the chiroi. And the chiroi are the lines of fate that run through everything. In some places, the chiroi are thick and important, and some places they are thin and, you know, largely irrelevant. And the people that can read the chiroi can put themselves where they need to be in order to essentially make the butterfly flap its wings in China and a hurricane then, you know, two years later rages across North America, right? That's what they do. Um, well, and then one exception to that, and this is that they gave me the rules of this. The Bible of this was like something that I came into largely. Um, I did not, uh, I did not create a lot of the basics of this. This was sort of already kind of part of the Bible, but I took it and I riffed on it. Kaivin is a lore mage in a very specific way. He can only see about two, three seconds into the future. And that's what those blue lines are that are coming at him or that show him where to attack. It's essentially giving him a sort of form of precognition, right? Which makes him a hell of a fighter, if you can imagine, right? I mean, like he can see where you're going to strike a split second before you do it. And he can start moving before your strike ever gets there. That's lore magic. And he has no idea that that's what he has at this point. So that's a little bit of a spoiler. He has no idea that this is what's happening to him. He calls it, as you noted in the chapter, probably his battle sense, like his battle eyes. Like when things start happening he just gets into battle mode or at least that's how he sees it how so how he so he doesn't realize that he has something extra that other people don't have nope nope and that's it's an pretty interesting cool. moment like a couple books down the way when he realizes that's what it is he's like kyvin decided he was going to do this one legitimately and he really tried to ignore the blue lines he was going to fight this guy man to man you know i mean like he he tries to you know avoid using the the cheat of his power because it, it really does give him an enormous advantage right um, so, and then the last and the, the final, uh, the fifth stream of magic is called line magic. Now line magic is like runes and line magic can do everything that the other four streams can do, but at about 50%, right? So it's not nearly as powerful. Like you couldn't, like a land mage could create a blast of, you know, a fireball that could, you know, destroy a mountain. A line mage could create a fireball that, you know, could light a barn on fire, maybe, right? Maybe. They can't do these big, huge, massively powerful spells, but their versatility 
enables them to sort of jump across the whole wide spectrum. You can have somebody that could, you know, heal a cut on your arm or maybe create a protective shield that would be long enough, you know, that'd be strong enough to last, you know, two seconds against dragon fire, but then collapse, you know, as opposed to like a real uh, land mage that could create, you know, a wall of wind that would stop the dragon fire completely, right? So line mages have to be a little bit clever. They have to plan out their work, not to mention the fact that they got to write it down first, right? They can't just go, you know, and shoot and shoot fire. They have to go, okay, let me, hang on a second, hang on a second. Let me write this down. You know I mean? Like, so that they have um, the, uh, the spell ready. So one of my main characters, his name is Slater. And Slater is a line mage and he essentially carries this little cylinder. Slater is a fan favorite, I have to say. Like I thought Kyvan was going to be the favorite character and he is for a lot of people, but I thought after him, it was going to be Ren, the sort of, you know, charismatic queen uh, swordswoman, swordswoman. But Slater is this ADHD sort of almost bumbling, but extremely smart mage who's thinking five steps ahead of everybody else. And he's constantly like working the problem that nobody else has reached so far. So people will ask him questions about what's going on in the moment and he will seem lost. But that's only because he only figured it out three minutes ago and couldn't wait for you guys because you're all boring and stupid. And he's going to continue forward, you know, figuring things out. So he's he is he's such a fun character to run. He's like got a million things that he's thinking about at any given moment. But anyways, he carries the cylinder of little clay discs that he has inscribed various runes on, except for the very last little quarter inch. So essentially they're not active. They are latent spells that the moment that he completes that line and like imbues them with his life force, the spell activates, right? So, um, so he's got, it's got, he's got like a little thing of poker chips, right? <laughs> and every time that's awesome. happens, he's like clicking through his poker chips going, I know, I know, I know what I need, I know what I need. And then he gets it. And then, you know, so, his spell is. so getting back to the Noxum and the yeah. spell over it, what's powering it. So is there these poker chips hanging around that, that somebody wrote the equation for it or the spell or the whatever? So the answer is yes and more. So, oh, that's, so give me the um, more. <laughs> sorry, I got I went down a rabbit hole there. Sorry. No, no, no. Um, I loved the rabbit hole. I'm still picturing Slater as the guy from Saved by the Bell because <laughs> I grew up when I was a kid when I watched that. And I, every time I hear the name Slater, like that's where my mind goes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that might be very appropriate, actually. I did not watch Save the Bell, but if he's an ADHD kid in high school, that's real close. That would be real close. Um, anyway, okay, so the Noctum. The Noctum was a master spell that was cast by Noctos himself. Noctos is essentially regarded as the first of the Noxanoi. The Noxanoi is the name of giants from Noxanon. And they came here and they took over this continent, right? Um, and Noctos was the biggest, baddest mofo of all of them. He was like the, the father of the tribe, right? Well, there were tribal, giant tribal wars between the different tribes of giants. And the Pyranoi, who come from Pyranon, wanted to destroy the Noxanoi. And essentially, the Noxanoi were probably the weakest of the giants. And so what Noctos did to even the playing field was he covered the whole continent in this huge Noctum. And essentially, before he did that, he made all of these advantages for his Noxanoi and for all the mortals, like the luminance being able to see in the dark and all this sort of thing, before he cast the spell. Then he cast the spell, and anybody trying to invade is immediately going to be plunged into complete darkness and be at a horrible disadvantage, right? So he created the best home field advantage that there was. When the Pyranoi tried to fix this. Essentially what they did was they threw a sun. It's called the Lux. And they threw it right in the middle of the continent to explode and destroy the Noctum. In order to save his spell, Noctos imbued his very powerful life force into the Noctum itself. So the Noctum now is more than just a spell. It is a spell that is held together. It's alive. It essentially is a living almost sentient creature. So it, it has its own regenerative powers and it has its own desire and its own agenda. And it's, it's because it's still, it's this giant that essentially imbued himself into the Noctum itself. So that's how the Noctum is perpetuated. So there is a constant fight between the Lux and the Noctum. They are locked in a stasis of permanent struggle. Um, and that is something that will be addressed in the latter parts of the, the series, which will be five books. Uh, my, my Legacy of Shadows story will be five books. And I'm just about, I'm like 106,000 words out of 110,000 words uh, with book four. So for those of you who have already started reading uh, the uh, Legacy of Shadows, you don't have long to wait for the next one. It's coming soon. All right. I want to know a little more about the struggle. So because I, 
when you described it, the Lux was this one-time fireball. So it wasn't a one-time fireball. This is a continuing um, spell that's constantly bombarding the continent. Doesn't that? How does that affect the characters who are living there then? Good question. So there's an entire race of creatures called the Brightlings. So say, okay, so let me let me explain the Shadowvar and the Brightlings. So the Shadowvar are these tiefling characters that I mentioned um, that uh, I wonder if there's uh, something I could show you that would be... I don't have anything with me. Okay, nothing I'm going to run away to. Okay, so so um, they have completely midnight black skin and sort of milk white horns. Now, their special trait is if they step into a shadow, even a normal shadow, not, not even the Noctum, they step into a shadow, they will vanish. Like they're essentially become the shadow, except for their white horns. So if you look into, you know, a dark alley and you see two white horns there, you know that there's somebody in there. <laughs> and oftentimes in order to sneak around, these shadow bar will cover their horns with like a dark cap, and then they can essentially be invisible in the dark. Um, on the flip side of things, the brightlings are just like the shadow are, except inverted. They have completely white skin, like milk white skin, and then of course ebony horns, and they vanish in bright places. So, like you know, ever been out on a really bright sunny day? Um, they'll just you won't be able to see them. They'll be like translucent, almost like they have almost like they have like a Doppler, like kind of like uh, the the um, uh, aircraft carrier in Marvel's uh, Avengers, right? Like where it's just like, like they turn on the thing and it all gets camouflaged. Mm -hmm. That's what a brightling would look like in the bright sun. Okay. Um, and, uh, and they live next to the Lux and that is like uh, a racial adaptation to living so closely to the Lux and the Demijos, which is a human race that lives down by the Lux. Cause essentially on the bottom of the continents, the Lux, you can see the Lux as this ball, this sun that is shining out. Hang on a second. I'll show you. So it's like a second sun. Yes. It's like a second sun. It looks like this. I'll show you the map. It's all on the map here. Um, here we go. You can see that. Boop, 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 boop. So you see the great Noctum and the Lux there. So that's oh, the largest okay. part. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. So the, the so all right. So we're looking at a map, and it's kind of sort of shaped like part of England, sort of. And down by, I'm not sure. I'm not so great with my English geography, but it does kind of have the Great Britain kind of shape. Um, it does. Th so there's this black ink spot with like tentacles wrapping around this white circular area. So and that's down at the sort of the bottom of the the continent that's pretty neat yeah so and if you turn it sideways it might actually resemble something we've already seen well, yes it does it so, does it, it resembles the pendant so yeah so um those that live on the southern continent have learned to adapt so the human uh, race the demijos that live down there um they wear sunglasses so like in this medieval world they have figured out how to create sunglasses to cut the glare of the Noctum so that they can operate in this, this very bright and sunny world. And a lot of them live in like the lee of say a mountain that's up between them and the Lux. I mean, most people do not live right next to the Lux. It would just be too bright. Now, the thing to note about the Lux, it does not give off heat like our sun. It just gives off light. So it's blinding, but not like, you know, doesn't incinerate you. It'd be kind of fun if it did. I would make it even more <laughs> challenging. <laughs> I'm, I'm the bottom of the continent would be completely uninhabited if that was the case. <laughs> but then the Noctum could be kind of comfortable, the parts that are close to it, because they'd be warmer. Because like I don't, if the if there's a spell of darkness over it, then you, it's probably colder than the rest of the continent because I'm, I'm assuming sunlight can't get into it. It's probably exactly. quite cool in there. Exactly. Any sources of heat would be ambient, you know, not, not direct for sure. Yep. Or magically created. I mean, some of the, some of the vegetation in the Noctum does create heat. So. Do they create their own bioluminescence or their own light to help yes, them? But you can't see it if you have normal eyes. Like you have to, you have to be a creature of the Noctum to see that light. And Laurel oh. discovered that in book two. Like, I mean, any normal person like you, me, we walk into the Noctum and it is like you are in a cave in Tennessee that is like three miles deep. Like that's, and no light. That's what it's like. It is complete. I don't know if you've ever been in a cave. Like, I mean, we I've all the cave. know what darkness is. It's like, oh yeah, I've been out on a cloudless night. No, you don't know no. what dark is until you're underground and there is actually no ambient light from anywhere. It is so disorienting. It's crazy. There's no, 
yeah, I, that, that freaked me out. I'm not much of an underground person, but I went uh, spelunking a little bit in Tennessee once and it was a little scary. <laughs> yeah, I went to some caves in Virginia and it was, I mean, they were beautiful. Yeah. But, and there's also some caves upstate in New York where I live. And that's the one where I experienced the complete darkness. It was really, you haven't, it. it's a whole other level of darkness. Right, exactly. That was exactly yeah. that. Like if you so, haven't done that, you can't know. Yeah. No, but now I'm wondering, like, because there's all right. I'm a I'm a ridiculous fan of science too, as and I, <laughs> as well as epic fantasy. So I'm wondering now if the mechanics of why you can't see it is maybe they're seeing X-ray or different because you know our eyes suck. We can't see like most of the light that's out there. Visible light is this very narrow band of the spectrum, right. but there's a lot of other light outside of that. X-rays, gamma rays, a whole bunch of other things that we can't see, but other creatures in this world can. So I'm wondering if your world, if that's what they're seeing, if like if X-rays and mm -hmm. other infrared rays or other things are able to get into there, and if that's what they're actually seeing is in a different band. You know, I'm not <laughs> a science idiot per se, but I'm not a master either. So like, I don't, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about whether it was like whether the noctum was something that, that creatures who could see natural spectrums of light that just humans couldn't see, could see in there. I hadn't thought about it that way. I thought of it as more of like a, it's a magical place where something different has taken hold and only the things that have adapted purely for this, this, this magical spell that's been created here um, can live there. That's kind of how I was, how I was seeing it. So, but I love the concept. I love that concept. Of it like still works though. Benefits. Yeah. I mean, maybe it, could. it still works though, because the Lux could be one spectrum of magic and the Noctum yes. could be a completely different one. And it would make total sense why you wouldn't be able to see both because human eyes suck. <laughs> <laughs> you can only see what you're genetically predisposed to see. And that is the narrow area that you are tied to. So either the Lux or the Noxum. So it still create, works. Yeah, I think you helped me just, just help me create something. Like the Brightlings, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about them. But what if the Brightlings, like the reason that they're so well adapted to that area is that they actually can see in the Lux. Like the rest of us are blind, but to them, it's just a different spectrum and they can see through I love that. Okay, That's so what was going through my head when you're talking about this. And I was like, I need, I need to ask this because like, I'm one of those ridiculous people who thinks about these things. Well, that's awesome. I love it. I love it. So they would have chances. Would, would the color of their irises matter at all as to what spectrums they could see? Because I'm thinking it'd be cool to have like something that was very. Yes. Yeah. I had to research this. Okay. So my, no, I don't want to hijack this because this is all about your books. No, no, but I love briefly. It. I love it. I also write a lot about, I have a light and dark based magic system and I write, usually I write everything for one specific character, Saren, who is an earth mage and his eyes glow green. And I have to constantly figure out like, uh, you know, how does that affect what he sees? And so it would color shift what he sees because his eyes are green and they glow green very brightly. So he would, everything he sees would have a green cast. Yeah. So your brightlings might be seeing things with a cast as well. And he also has mage sight, but it's very particular to, I, I'm not going to go into the complicated rules of magic in my world. I did it just, you know, for fun to make it, it's more fun when you have all sorts of like complications and things you can't do and figuring out how to get around that. And, but so he's got this mage sight and when he's looking at things with that, he's seeing in black and white and shades of green. And that's it. He's not seeing anything else when he's looking at the mage site. So your brightlings could have something like that. Like when they're looking into their magical spectrum, they may not see it the way that we see it, or they may see it, they may see it the way we see it, but it's, you know, it's, there could be some adaptation to keep it from being brighter. Cause if you think about the human eye in bright light, our pupils contract and you see a, your iris gets a lot bigger mm -hmm. and in darkness it's the opposite your iris practically disappears and your pupil takes over because you need to see better so you could do stuff with that or you can add like extra things to their eyes because they're different animals that see in different spectrums and their eyes are very different from how eyes work 
So I would say maybe do a little bit of like research on that just for fun. And you might see some things that you can take and use. From. I do that because that's nature does a lot of really cool stuff. And like, why make it up when I could borrow it from nature? You know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I love that. It kind of kicked me off into another idea that at, at a certain, well, no, that's probably too much of a spoiler. But anyways, you gave me another idea. Oh, that damn. I'll, eventually <laughs> you'll, uh, you'll uh, yeah, that's too much. It's too much of a spoiler. I can't, that's, that's like something that doesn't happen <laughs> until book four, the end of book four. So I don't want to. I don't want to ruin anything for anybody that might actually want to read the book. So I can't promise that I won't keep prying because that's my job interviewing but you is to it. try and get a spin. I can't promise that I'm going to hold to my party line. You know, I'm just, I, I, I get excited about it and I'll just start talking. Maybe, maybe the best we can do is just warn people on the podcast, like, oh, big spoilers coming. And you may want to shut down if you don't want to hear the spoiler. So I'll put a little warning that there might be spoilers. <laughs> there um, may be spoilers. Yeah, because well, so I'm. Want me to tell you then? You want me to tell you what happens at the end of book four? Yes, but okay. no. I mean, right. we don't want to no. spoil it for readers. The whole point is to to <laughs> to get them to come over and give that a try and fall in love with Kyvan the Unkillable, or if not Kyvan, then Slater, or I think you said her name was Ren, um, or the be interested in the Noctum and the locks. I'm very interested in all of this. Um, I'm <laughs> buying a copy immediately after this. Um. <laughs> well, you'll have to let me know what you think. I will. <laughs> I'm not sure when I'll get to it. I have to, between my job and, and I have so many interviews lined up, but it might be a few months before I get to it. But well, I'm I will warn you, very if you curious. Have cover and you read more than like 30, 40 pages, I cannot be held responsible for uh, staying up late nights. I, you can't. You can't put that on me. I've, I've had so many uh, uh, people put up reviews saying like, okay, I started reading this at nine o'clock. It's now two o'clock and I need to go to sleep and I can't put the book down. So I've had that happen. So I just want to warn you, if you get into it, usually it takes about 30, 50 pages before it starts becoming the page turner that it is. Um, but it will keep you up. It will keep you up at night. <laughs> well, I'm going to, I my, I have some vision issues, so I'm going to, I'm going to do it either through Google play if it's available or um, if I can get um, Amazon, um, the Kindle uh, app to read it to me. Oh, okay. Cause I, I can't read on screen for a long periods of time anymore. Gotcha, like, gotcha. I, I don't know if it's the eye stream from my job, but like, I just find that the words start like blurring up. And so I've been doing a lot more of like the text to speech, um, Absolutely. Things. They've got some pretty yeah. sophisticated um, uh, text to speech programs these days. I'm so grateful for that because I love reading and I love audiobooks, but not all the books that I want to read are audiobooks. Audio so books. I'm kind of yeah. stuck in this like, my eyes won't let me read on screen. I want to read this book. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I hear you. Yeah. And it's something that, that we indie authors are, are dealing with across the board. I mean, some of us can afford to make audiobooks. Some of us can't and have to try and make it ourselves. Yep. And, you know, yep, I've struggled with that. I have struggled that with that myself. Not all, uh, Some of my books are on audiobook. Not all of them are on audiobook. And that's the reason. Yep. Yeah. Uh, same. I, I, well, actually, mine are only available in um, digital narrated audiobooks on Google Play or my website. I I'm trying to narrate one of my own books, but I hate the sound of my voice, so it's very challenging. You got a good voice. You got a good Thank voice. Thank you. Voice. Yeah, yeah. Every time I try to edit one of them or read them, there's all this drama in my head. Like, oh, you have to give this person a unique voice. Yeah, and I'm like, how do I do that for all the characters? Yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Keeping the same, like if you decide to affect an accent for one of your, or or affect a t type of, you know, turn of phrase or, or you know, timbre of speech, it's, it's important to remember to do it the same because readers, listeners will notice, they'll notice the difference. Um, and sometimes you so. can't remember. You're like, I, I don't, you get to that person's point by dialogue and you're like, I don't remember what I did for them. <laughs> yep. Oftentimes I'll have to go back and listen and like even listen a few times until I've got it in my head. Then I go, okay. Okay. Cause like um, I've been, I've been working on and it's, it's not finished, but I've been working on the Kyvan audiobook. I'm doing it myself. And, and Vaughn, the shadow bar has a little sort of, I'm not going to say that it's an English accent, but it's like kind of close. It's just like an, an affected speech. And then of course Slater talks, you know, <laughs> talks very much like, like a uh, uh, excited kid. Cause he is pretty much most of the time. Um uh, yeah, so so that's yeah, but but keeping it consistent is important for sure, for sure. And it's hard. Yeah, it's it's not easy. Nope, <laughs> nope. 
it's a, it's a, it's an adventure. It's a, it's a, it's definitely a, a journey and a whole lot of work, whole lot of work. But you know, we're also audiobook fans, so that's why we want to do it. We want to try, yep. and maybe someday I will finish reading mine. I'm really wishing that the first book wasn't so damn long. <laughs> <laughs> It just, I mean, it's, I love the story, but it's like, I just keep looking at it. I'm like, why does the amount of pages I have to read not seem to be diminishing? <laughs> what am I doing wrong? <laughs> <laughs> like I said, there's a whole lot of drama in the head when, when I'm doing the these things. Is, yeah. Once you get to the end of it, like when you finally get done with all the recording, you got to go back and you got to edit. And that mm -hmm. is the worst. I just, yes. oh man, it bores me so badly. It bores me so badly. Yeah. But, you know, it's worth it. You know, yep. there, there are a lot of people who need it and a lot of people who want it. So it's, it's worth it. And we're trying. Yes. <laughs> Give yes, us the grace and space because yes. it's not easy. <laughs> we'll get them to you. Maybe not right yeah. away. We'll get them to you. Yeah. All right. So we need to go back to Kaivin and the story and because... This is this is just cool. I I love that. There's, I, I this is so cool. I, so, do, is there a specific order people need to read? Is this? Oh, you've got the trilogy. Did every author write a trilogy on their continent? But you, so you're, as you said, there's going to be five books. Yeah, okay. I'm, a, I'm a little faster than than the other okay. at this point. So they each have one book in their series out at this point. Um, and you can access Eldros Legacy as a property through any one of their first books, right? You could probably access it through, you could even access it through the cohorts books, which don't, you know, like I said, sometimes they're not connected to the meta plot. Mm -hmm. If you just want to get in, if something looks like this is my cup of tea and you want to get into it and read it, then you can access it from there. For my story, and we say, if you're, you know, generally speaking, if you don't know where to start and you don't know, like say you don't have any, like if you want to start with dragons, Draconon is the continent of dragons. So the Forgotten King is the name of the first book in Draconon. So starting with that is not, a, you know, that, that's, a, that's a good idea if that's your thing, right? Um, generally speaking, all things being equal, what we say is start with Kaivin. It introduces, the, you know, the world of Eldros. It introduces the world of Noctum, Noxanon. And it does give you a ramp up, right? I mean, you got three mm -hmm. books in that story. So you won't be waiting for the next, uh, the next story. But like I said, you can access it through any of the continents. Whichever continent strikes your fancy, you can do that. But there are three books in the Metaplot story in Noxanon, one book in Draconon, one book in uh, Pyronon, and one book in um, Daemonon. And there will be more for those other continents. Yep. In fact, I believe Pyronon, she just got her second book finished, The Rough Draft, and that'll be coming out towards the end of the year. So that one is on the way. And I know that Daemonon, um, he's real close to the end of his second book. Like I said, I mean, they're, they're doing it. They're, I'm just a, just a little bit, I was a little bit of an overachiever the first year. I got really excited about the story. Um, so I kind of wrote two books in the first year. We were all going to do one book per year. And um, I got two books in the first year and then couldn't wait for the third one and got the third one done just at the beginning of this year. It just came out in, in February. So, so, so we need to read all of the books in the Eldritch legacy and then progress to the books with the meta plot. Is that how we, we need to do that? I would say start with the meta plot. So the meta plot, like Kyvan kicks off the meta plot as okay. each of the first books and the others. I think, okay. So I, I'm being, I'm just trying to figure book. out how to navigate yeah. this because I'm, there's I'm multiple authors. To navigate this. Here's yeah. how you do it. Read Kyvan yeah. first, then Laurel, then Ren. That's the way you want to start the story. That'll get you nice and immersed in the world. And then once you get to the end of that, you're like, oh my gosh, what else? Then uh, start with Seeds of Dominion, which is the first Daemonon novel. And then um, Forgotten King, which is the Draconon. And then Embers and Ash. I believe that is the way we have them listed on Amazon. That's the, that's okay. the order. So the order on Amazon is listed out that way. I just want okay. to people understand that they could access it differently, but the recommended way to access is start with Kaivin. Go through Laurel, go through Ren. That'll get you all wound up on the meta plot, and then you can start kind of looking at, at the, the other. And then, you know, there's some really great, great stories. In fact, a um, uh, lot of, of buzz around the Stone Whisper, or Stone Whisper, I believe, is the, the 11th novel that just came out by Haley Greger. Um, H.Y. Greger is the, the name on the book. And um, uh, that, one's, that one's coming out on the 13th, I want to say, February 13th. 
So, um, and, and it's, it's, it's a great story. Uh, the Pain Bearer by Kendra Merritt is also another great story. It's in Noxanon. It is, uh, it follows like kind of, kind of a, a, a magic archeologist. Um, and she's a fascinating character. Like she's got some physical um, detriments. So she, she's not like, she's not like a Kaivin character where he's leaping all over the place and chopping things down and like an athlete extraordinaire. Like she, if she hikes a mile, she's, she's going to be hurting. Right. But she's got special abilities that make her exactly the right person for this particular story that she's entering into. And Kendra Merritt is a fantastic author. Um, she, yes, uh, she, she is. I, yeah. You know who Kendra is? Yes, I do. Yes, oh, okay. we've interacted. I, I do. I think it was on TikTok. Um, maybe elsewhere. Not hundred percent sure. Not. We ne never sat down and talked in person. She's somebody I would love to get on here. So. Um, oh well, we can make tell that her. Happen, sure. Yeah, <laughs> I would love to know. get all the authors who are part of this on there. It's yeah, really interesting well, and. I would love to ask them lots of pointy questions and try and get yeah, spoilers. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you'll get very different answers from what you get from me. Like I said, every continent is there. That's their baby, right? And they get to make up the rules in that continent. Now we have all agreed to adhere to certain structural rules like the magic system. We all have the five streams of magic. That is, that is canon. We all call giants Eldroy. That is the name mm -hmm. of giant in general. A giant from Noxanon is called Noxanoi. A giant from Daemonon is called Daemonoi. Pyranoi, Draconoi, etc. So those are all rules that we share, but you get into the races of each individual world, vastly different. Like you've got humans, everybody's got humans, but like Quincy who does Daemonon, his elves are going to be called something else. And Mark's elves are going to be called something else probably. Maybe they'll just call them elves, but that's totally up to them. So it's really kind of cool. I mean, one of the things that's great about this project is not only do we have different people writing in it, but everybody's got different style. It is all, we call it high fantasy, high epic fantasy, right? Um, and and we stick to a PG-13 rating. That's that's yep. the idea. That's the As idea, do I. Right? Um, and so so that was those were kind of the parameters for how we write. But if you want to write like a mystery story within this epic fantasy, then you can write a mystery story. If you want to write, you know, like, I mean, everybody has a different pacing, a different voice. And it's so cool to see how people do things differently. Like Marie Whitaker, who is one of the founders, her story, she, her background is horror, right? So there's some very horrific, nasty elements in her story. And it's kind of fun to see her flavor of it. Right. And how she, how she does this. Like she's got, okay. you need to get them all on here. Really? I'd like to talk to them all individually. And then I'd love to do a panel thing with yeah. all of you. I think that could be very cool. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do it. We'll do it. I'll let them know. Yeah. Tell them to contact me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'll have have your people you. contact. Well, I don't have people. It's just me. I have fictional <laughs> characters, but they don't answer emails. <laughs> they don't answer. Oh, man. I wish, I I wish. Could my fictional characters answer emails. I wish. That would be fun. I mean, I can I answer for them, but I, I wish they could actually answer email because that would be yes. kind of fun because then I'd have to read their response and not know what it said to people. And that could be sort of fun. I like surprises like that. <laughs> yes, for sure. I would. It would be both wonderfully gratifying and maybe a little bit scary to have my characters speak to me without me being the one that's like coming up with their voice. I'm pretty sure Kai would be pretty angry at me for all the crap oh, no. that I put him through. <laughs> oh, that's wild. Maybe I should do an episode where we bring on people and have them like, what would your character say to you? <laughs> <laughs> I know what mine would say to me. <laughs> Yeah, Kaiman doesn't really speak a whole lot unless he's got, you know, unless he's angry about something and then, you know, he'll say a few words and then try and kill you. That's pretty much. <laughs> well, maybe you need to, if you uh, if you ever do meet him face to face, make sure there's no sharp objects and no blunt objects. Preferably you meet in a padded cell yeah. where there's just pillows. Yeah, I, I mean, Kyvan is six foot three and like 230 pounds of solid muscle. Like it's not going to matter whether he's got a sword or not. If he was going up against me, I would die. I would just, he'd wrap me up in a ball and crush me is what would happen. Oh no. I'd probably come up to his stomach or something. I'm, I'm tiny. <laughs> I'm very short. <laughs> I'm well, like five two. One, but I still don't think that I can hold a candle to Kyvan. <laughs> I would just have to run away. <laughs> I would yeah. not be able to do anything else because I'm pretty tiny. <laughs> <laughs> See, now if you had a Noctum cloak, then you could just wrap yourself up in it and travel from any shadow to any shadow. So then you could get away from them. So we'll just That's have, pretty cool. have to make sure that you get a Noctum cloak is all. That'd be very cool. Is there like the Lux version so that if you're in a very bright place, you can also disappear? 
Well, we have not explored the Lux very much yet. It's all been. About I think the you're going to be doing that soon. Yeah, I have a feeling I'm going to be doing that too. <laughs> I want to know if there's a Lux amulet. <laughs> right? Yeah, an amulet of the Lux. Yes, yes. Very yin yang, if there is. And yeah. then, what would happen if someone had both? Could do they cancel each other out? Like, how would you carry both? Like, I think they would fight. I think they. I mean, like based on the relationship, if they were based at all on the relationship between the Noctum and the Lux, they would. You know, that, that, like I said, it's they're locked in an eternal. Yeah. Um, but. Could you put them in something, in some material or something that would block that so you could carry both? Right. Yeah, I don't think you'd, yeah, you'd have to like. See, a, lots of questions. <laughs> yeah, well, you could, you could have a, a maverick iron lined case. So maverick iron is another element of the world. And essentially what it is, is it's, it's radioactive iron. It's like, like um, uranium or something like that, but it holds magic. Um, and so um, if you have, if you're a giant, your giant's blood um, is so thick with magic that you can wield Maverick Iron and it doesn't hurt you, right? I mean, so they make everything out of Maverick Iron. They make all of their magical talismans out of Maverick Iron. But if you're a human, there's a scene actually in Kaivin the Unkillable where they go into the Naragi and one of the warriors gets this Maverick Iron sword and he picks it up and he's, it's like, it's six foot long and the blade is like that wide, right? But he picks it up and he's like, this is like a feather. He's like, I could carve through armies with this. So he takes it home with him. And uh, the next day, the skin sloughs off his body. The muscles are like, yeah. you know, falling off his body because they're not, you know, you're not supposed to be around that stuff. It's like radioactive isotope yep. that he's been handling and sleeping with. And now he's dead. Right. So, um, so that's, that's an element of the world. That's pretty cool. This has been awesome. And <laughs> I, I hope that we can connect with some of the other, that would be very, oh, I would cool. love to do a little, I don't know what we would call this series. And I, epic fantasy authors will always be in my heart because that's what I love. And that's what I write. <laughs> So you all have well, a, definitely. If, we'll get it going. Yeah. So if any of you epic fantasy authors are listening to this, yeah, you're always welcome. Hit me up. I will try to get spoilers out of you as well and ask pointed <laughs> questions about your lore because I'm interested. <laughs> That's a promise. Maybe a threat too. <laughs> I'm pretty inquiring. <laughs> This has been fabulous. Anything else you want to say about Eldros Legacy or Kaivin the Unkillable or where to find you? There will be all the links down there, but it's also good to rattle them off on here if you want to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, There's so much more to say. It's such a oh, fun, say great world. Well, I mean, like I could go on. I go on for hours talking about Eldros Legacy, but let's just say EldrosLegacy.com. So E-L-D-R-O-S-L-E-G-A-C-Y.com. Um, just head there. It's got the whole package. You can buy things straight off the website, all 11 novels. Well, as of the 13th, all 11 novels when, uh, when Haley's comes out and there's a lot of short stories. I highly recommend getting the short stories. There may, may actually still be a link for free short stories that give kind of kickoff, um, uh, stories. Like it gives Kyvan's origin story when he was 10 years old, um, uh, that I think we still give away for free just to kind of get people interested in it um, that I believe is on the website. Um, you can find us on Facebook. We've got a, a Facebook group, Eldros Legacy. And um, and then my information, toddfonestock.com. You can also find the stories there. And then I've got a, a Facebook page, Todd Fonestock, uh, fantasy author is on Facebook as well. You can find me there. I, and, and I go to a lot of cons. Like I'm planning to go to 24 comic cons this year. So wow. that's two a month. Yeah. So you can find me probably if you live in the West somewhere, you can probably find me somewhere. I'm going to be in LA for the LA comic con. I'm going to be in San Diego. Um, I'm going to be at Denver fan expo. Of course, there's a couple of Christmas uh, things that are happening in Colorado Springs and Denver that I'm going to be, be at fan expo, excuse me, fan X in Salt Lake city in September. Um, so I'm going to be all over the place and you can check that out on my website, toddfonestock.com. T O D D F as in Frank, A H N as in Nancy, E S and Sam, T O C K.com. Wow. That's 24 more cons than I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of my thing. I like going to cons. I love meeting fans face to face. I've never been to a con. I need to so one of these days I'm going to get enough time off from work and go to a, it's just go as a regular person to them, not as an yeah. author, just because I've never been. I'm in New York. I'm when oh, okay. I'm about an hour outside New York city. 
Oh, they got good con there. New York, they uh, do. New York Comic Con is a good con. So, but I'm always working. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's something. It's some to see. It's some to see. There's. I just. I always feel like it's very frantic on the one hand, and I'm I'm like right dead center between extrovert and introvert. So I can definitely go and be around the big crowds for a limited amount of time, and then at a certain point, I get I get kind of antsy. Like there's just too much. But I always feel welcomed at these places because I mean. Comic cons these days and fan cons are places where people can go and express themselves like loudly um, right. with the way that they dress and what they're interested in. And everybody is so accepting. And I just, I got a real heart space for that. I love that. I mean, people show up in their costumes um, and walk around all day getting to be the person that they want to be for this entire day. And people just totally support it. It's a wonderful thing. It's really a wonderful thing. I love them. I'm at the whole other end of the spectrum. Like I'm an introvert. I'd probably be hiding under my blue cloak. <laughs> yeah. You know, though, like I have found like I've there, there's some people that wear, as I'm sure, you know, like some pretty risque costume costumes. Mm. Right. And like, I've talked to a few of them and one of them, I was like, so does it, are you, do you feel like kind of exposed? Cause you kind of look like you're kind of exposed. And she was like, Nope. I like, this is the way that I hide. Like, so, so like, it was such a strange turning of the facet right it's like this is the exact opposite of what i would be in my normal life and so i'm coming here in disguise you know and yeah. i'm like that just it took me a second to wrap my head around it's like wow you know i mean like that is such a cool way of of looking at it of of relating to something that probably terrifies her in her her normal life but to come here and do that she gets to be this person and kind of set herself outside of her mind and do something she would never do i just i thought it was great i thought it was so great no it, it is i i used to go to ren fairs a lot before my sister passed away she was my constant companion at them uh, not as an author i was there i was there for the i was there to watch the joust mm -hmm. i was there for all the entertainment I was the person dragging her at all the different things. And she was like, do we really have to see this again? We saw the joust last year. I was the same. And I'm like, I don't care. They might do it's something really different. Hard. I don't really care. Hard. I love these things. So, um, and people come there in a variety of crazy costumes. We used to go in costumes. Uh, it was, so I, I understand that piece of it because Ren Fair, the New York Renaissance Fair is on a whole, <laughs> whole other yeah. level. Um, I've never been to any other Ren Fair, but it's, it's enormous. Um, and it's, well, people come from all over to go yeah. to it. So it's, apparently it's a thing. It's a big thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, someday I, I, an introvert, I'm sorry, an extrovert will adopt me and we will go to a con be, so that I can be their shadow. Because that's, that's my, that's my well, if, ever I'm at a con, <laughs> if ever I'm at a con on the East Coast, you can come and see me. You can, ha you can hide behind the booth if you want. We'll, give you, we'll get you a uh, vendor pass and you can just come and sit behind the booth and watch the world go by. There's a certain safety in having a booth, I have to tell right. you. Like you can kind oh, of like, okay. have your own little space there, you know. But then you have to talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have to talk to people. I actually like to talk to people when I'm talking about my stories. Um, I have pitches like I did the Eldros pitch for you about the 2000 years ago, right. the world was ruled. I've got those for all of my books and I, I know them inside and out. And I love them. I still love telling them all the time. I like people getting interested in what it is that I do. And um, once I see their eyes light up, I'm like, you're going to like this. I can tell. I can tell you're going to like it. I want to have that energy, but I'm very much like people ask me what about I'm like, um, it's a book. <laughs> It has a green cover. It's there's trees. There's an enchanted forest. <laughs> like I completely like forget like everything about it, or I'll just rattle off like the rules of the enchanted forest because like that's it's always sitting there in the back of my mind because I have to keep that in mind for every book because every book I write is set in the same world, so it's the same rules for all of them. <laughs> yeah, good. That's good. And you, and don't piss off the enchanted forest because it will kill you. So. <laughs> Sentient, sentient, these sentient things that are like not necessarily humans. Like the Noctum is sentient like that. I love that. I love that stuff. Uh, some of the some of the enchanted trees are um very sentient and very intelligent and very magical. And uh, some of them are actually mages and can cast Ooh, I mean mages. it gets yeah, oh yeah. The the queen of their country is a giant enchanted tree. Oh, I love that. I love that. She's not currently ruling it. She doesn't really want to deal with any of the politics. It's a bunch of humans ruling it. They outlawed magic, but they can't do anything about her. The enchanted forest are kind of permanent fixtures. So yeah. It's it's there's this eventually we're going to have a war and, and 
that'll all come to a head. But the characters have not just they don't want to do that yet. So um, I don't know when that will come, but that's somewhere in the future. <laughs> they don't follow outlines. So I keep outlining it and they keep avoiding it. So <laughs> I don't know when we're going to get to that. <laughs> Those characters are the best characters. They, they take you to surprising places. I love that. Yeah, they're currently chasing dragons now in a book that wasn't supposed to exist. So I don't know where we're going in that one. <laughs> I'm just along for the ride. I'm just I'm just chronicling their madness and their mayhem and all the things that they are doing because they burned the outline three books ago and we're in uncharted territory. Now. I feel you. I feel you. Yeah. I keep trying to be a plotter, but the characters won't let me, so I end up pantsing it all. Yep, I'm the same way. I'm a dyed in the wool pantser. And I've studied some structure books and I do use them as much as I can. But like you, I deviate. It's like I, I plot them out and then, you know, like have you ever heard of Save the Cat? Save the Cat yes. structure? Okay. So I plotted out Kyvan on a Save the Cat structure, right? And in Act One, after I'd plotted it out and then I wrote it, and Act One was like 90% what I plotted out. And Act Two was like 50% what I plotted out. And act three was like 10%. What I, plot. I mean, it like, it like started to curve to the left and then it just shot over, you know, there was just no keeping to the original track. So. I'm jealous that you got the first act to be 90% of it. Cause like right? I've, I've had books where like in chapter two, they were like, mm, I don't want to do this. Yeah. We're going over here. I, yeah. I, I I had a whole book that took a left turn and then the sequel we had to, I had to scrap what I was going to do in the sequel because we were so far from where the sequel was going to be. And we had to finish what we were doing. There's a whole bunch of arcs that had gone off into left field that had to be, that was for anybody who's listening, the book that took the extreme left turn was curse breaker falls. It was not planning on having Sarn lose his magic, but he'd made the wrong decision and I couldn't do anything about it. So we, had to do book five with him having no magic. Our most powerful mage in, in that story had no, no magic at all yeah. with a giant ancient evil and monsters. And it, it was not a good situation, but you know. <laughs> then he had, then he had to get his magic back and try to get, you know, it, it ended up being a really good book, but trying to figure out how do I get back a thing that I was not planning on having him lose was um, that was a brain teaser. Yeah, that's what makes great story, though. You know, you write yourself totally in your corner and then you got to write yourself out again and it surprises you. If it surprises you, it's going to surprise the reader. You know, chances are good. Yeah, I don't think anybody saw that coming because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see it coming. There have been many moments like that. Um, that many moments. Uh, at the end of book six was another moment where I had no idea how we were going to get out of that one. Thankfully, in book two, the we had the answer just show up randomly in a throwaway scene. Um, and I was rereading it. And I was like, ah, I've got the opposite, like literally sitting in the freaking river of this magical problem. And I forgot about it. So I love when stuff like that happens where you can utilize something from books ago. That was like, you know, sometimes we write these little threads that go nowhere. Yeah. You know? I don't know what that's going to do, but I'm just going to leave it there. Cause I like yeah, it. Yeah. And then yeah, like it's cool. down the road, you're like, yep. that's what I need right now. And it can look yes. like I intended that to happen. And maybe, you know, who knows, maybe my subconscious did intend that to happen somehow. So, I mean, sometimes I wonder, you know, they say kill your darlings, but there's some darlings that like, we just can't bring ourselves to kill. And then you find out five books later that like, that was the thing you needed. And you're like, yes, so glad I didn't cut that. Yep. Yep. I have had I that happen too. Yeah, this has been fantastic. So um, we're we'll we'll have Todd back. I'm sure you're you're a fast writer. I'm sure we will have you back again. You're always welcome, and Thank we'll you. have yeah, hopefully a blast. Yeah, and hopefully we'll have some more authors from the Eldros Legacy. And I would love to do some kind of panel thing with all of them. I think that could be great fun. For sure, we've done a few of those before. We love it. We we have fun playing off each other. So yeah, it sounds like it could be really good fun. We could have like a lot of we could we could really like. We could really, because I think you, you guys have such an interesting lore and history. Like, I think we could have like a really fun discussion about that. Um, and, and, and some of the, and some, and obviously some of the individual stories as well, but you have just such a cool lore that like, I love to dig more into it. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. You'll enjoy it. If you enjoyed what you heard so far, you're going to love it. You're going to love it. This was fantastic. We are way over time, but um, yeah, I that always happens. 4.30. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, this this always happens when I talk to every fantasy authors because like I'm just there's always so much world building and so much right. lore to dig into, and like I want to dig into all of it because <laughs> that's that's who I am. So thank you so much, yeah, my pleasure. and thank you for joining me. I'm Melinda Cusera, an indie fantasy author, and thank you so much to our guests for coming on here. It means so much to me to talk to fellow entrants to the self-published fantasy blog off. This year is number nine. 300 books can enter. 10 will reach the semifinals and one will be crowned the winner. My book, Curse Breaker Enchanted, is of course in the running this year. And I'm very excited about that. So I hope you're cheering it along at home. And I also hope that our guest today, that their book also goes on to the semifinals. We won't find out for many months yet, as far as I know. This is my first time participating. So if we find out sooner, I'll let you know. And... If you want to be more involved, you can join my community on Patreon where all podcast episodes are released early and you can read the 10th and the 11th book in the Curse Breaker series because I'm writing them both on there and you'll get copies before anyone else, which gives you bragging rights, of course. And I'll have links to all of our guest books as well as mine in the show notes. And yeah, thank you so much. I will see you next time. And yes, if the sound is better this time, it's because I got a new microphone and number four is the winner, I guess. I've tried three microphones before this. Um, two of them wouldn't connect. One of them didn't sound all that fabulous, but this one sounds pretty good to me. So hopefully it sounds good to you as well. And hopefully I won't have any more sound issues that have plagued me in the past. I would like to return to reading excerpts from Chris Breaker Enchanted as well as other books. So it was really important to me to find a good microphone and I think we might have finally done it. So I look forward to bringing you more fantasy, lore, and more in the coming weeks. Thank you so much. Have a great day if you're listening to this in the daytime or a great night if you're listening to this at night. And once again, I'm your indie fantasy author, Melinda Cusera. Thank you.